Over the months, we've done a lot of stories about boats and ships on this line in Guam, but never have we or anyone else done a story about a submarine. We went along for a ride. The USS Hawkbill was launched in 1969. She is a nuclear-powered attack submarine, nearly as long as a football field. Commander George Rolliter is proud of his ship, but there's a limit to what he can tell you about it because it's nearly all classified. Well, basically, uh, our open statement is the fact that the uh, uh, ship can go uh, deeper than 400 feet, and 400 feet has been a magical number since World War II, since that's been our submarine's uh, depths at that time, and we can go in excess of 20 knots. Uh, primarily, that's simply so that uh, we kind of keep to ourselves what our capabilities are so that uh, enemy defenses cannot be uh, set up against us. To come aboard the deck on a submarine, you cross a gangplank, just like on regular ships. But since this ship operates underwater, obviously you don't stay on deck for long. To go below, reporters and everyone else shows their best side first. And this is your first introduction to a steep ladder and a tight squeeze. You have entered a crowded world with no windows, but periscopes instead. And on modern submarines, you may look through the periscope directly, but most people see what's above on television monitors. Those monitors are located in the control room and in other areas of the ship. Apra Harbor looks just about the way you'd expect, but the view is better for folks riding topside as the ship makes her way out of the harbor. But they come below then before the submarine does the job it was built to do. The hatches are closed and everything is secure. Die. Die. Once submerged, the Hawkville can stay down for weeks on end. She once spent 21 days under ice in the Bering Sea. Spending that much time in a crowded environment may not sound like fun to you and me, especially when you're down with as many as 137 other people, all of them men. But some people want to do it, and one of them is from Guam. He's Felix Sablon, formerly of Agate, now a chief on the USS Hawkbill. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know any other kind of life since I came in the Navy. Submarines have been all with uh, my sea duty uh, life. What village were you from on Guam? Agate. Did you ever imagine that you'd be spending a lot of your time underwater? No, as a matter of fact, before I came into service, I always wanted to be a sky jumper, but uh, I lacked the weed necessary for that, but uh, I guess I chose the next best thing, submarine force. But most submariners will admit there are some problems with this way of life. The only really private space you have is your bunk. And that's a big problem if you're six feet, six inches tall like this guy. The bunks are six foot four. Electrician's mate Jeffrey Heikert says submarine life is just plain different. Well, you can't go anywhere. You know, you're stuck in this place uh, on the submarine when you're in a way, but it's not too bad. It gets, you learn to adapt to it, just to different people and stuff like that. And mate Jesse Hicks says there are arrangements to make submariners comfortable. In fact, even if you're at sea for weeks, you can get the news through satellite communications. We do get occasional sports on board. We find out. We do get news updates while we are at sea. Uh, we can't get everything, but we do get a lot. We're not really too much out of touch when we get back in. And sailors can also get news of the family through what they call family grams. Chris Gerke. Family gram is uh, something that your parents, your wife, whatever, can send. It's a little mail-in thing they can send to the squadron, and they send it to the ship via a message form. And it's just a, for your family to know what's going on, and let them tell you what's going on with the family, and everything's okay. And the food is not all submarine sandwiches, and it's not all bad. Food's good. We got good cooks on board. <laughs> I like food. <laughs> but Gary Birkenville says it does take a unique type of character to be a submariner. 
The coral that lies beneath the waves. You've got to be able to, to get along with people, ignore some of their faults, and hope they ignore some of yours. One submariner who is well known on Guam was Admiral Bruce DeMars. He's left the island now for the Pentagon. But DeMars says he never regretted the decision to go into submarines. I immediately enjoyed it when I got aboard submarines because it is a small ship. Uh, normally 10 or 12 officers, 100 enlisted men, a very important mission, even in those days, although it was only a diesel electric submarine. And you, you meet uh, responsibility and challenge much more quickly, and uh, there's a premium on everyone knowing their job and, and performing efficiently right down through the enlisted ranks. So it's a very satisfying part of the military. Admiral DeMars has no problem recommending submarine life to young sailors. Chris Clausen agrees. As career counselor on the Hawkville, he works with people to get them to remain with the force. If you'll take a look around this submarine, it's probably one of the most professional forces you've ever seen, and the average age is somewhere between 22 to 24. I like that about submarines. Uh, and I try and keep them in the Navy. No pun intended now, but life aboard a submarine does have its ups and downs. But there are some things to do for exercise and recreation. I have a bicycle on board. You can go take, imagine you're taking a spin around the block somewhere in a marathon. But we have weights on board we can work with. We get to watch movies and you're off watches and stuff. You have video down here. You can listen to music. Go to your rack, sleep, read, whatever. You've always got somebody to talk to. You can always, you know, you can escape different ways by reading, playing cards or something? Sleep. <laughs> well, you can do just about anything you want, you know, anything like cal calisthenics or, uh, you know, for entertainment we have a reading, we have a nice entertainment system over there where you can watch TV and you can, uh, we have tapes, video tapes that come on board, a lot, of, a lot of movies on board. This area controls the atmosphere on the submarine, keeping the air fit to breathe. In fact, submariners claim the air is so good that when you come into port and climb out of the hatch, your first breath of fresh air is just about enough to gag you. You get a headache when you come up. <laughs> fresh air makes you have a headache. I think we breathe cleaner air down here, and when we get up, we get a headache. But it's nice to get back on land, go out and enjoy yourself, do some swimming, whatever. Again, most of the facts about submarines are classified. Cable photographer Tim Rock was only allowed into certain areas of the ship, not into the torpedo room, nor near the reactor or main engine, and not near sonar equipment. We were not allowed to tape depth gauges and so on. But we did get a look at the way people live on board. They are confident in the ship. You'd have to be. There is a diesel backup engine in case the reactor had to be shut down, but that wasn't needed the day we were out. Your main view of the outside world is through the periscope. Only a few ride on the deck on the surface. Even fewer ride at the very top of what they call the sail. Basically, life on a submarine is life indoors. It's a strange world, and except for a few lighting adjustments, you'd never even know whether it was day or night. Basically, most of the ship stays rigged for white. In other words, we have white fluorescent lights throughout the ship. Uh, however, in the control room, in the attack center, where uh, when we come to periscope depth or we surface where it would be dark at night, we rig those portions for red. And we use actually red lights, and that's so that the officer of the deck and all the other watchstanders who uh, would come in contact uh, with the darkness of the, light of the night, uh, their eyes are accustomed to the darkness, and therefore they can quickly adapt to uh, night vision. Otherwise, you don't know if it's there. Otherwise, you don't know. And, uh, Living compartments, uh, normally since we rotate in our watches every six hours and a guy is coming on watch, he'll be on for six hours and off for 12 hours. Uh, his only way of knowing that it's uh, night or day is by going up in the control room. Or check his watch. That's right. But sometimes that's hard to do if you're working a 12-hour system. There really wasn't any adjustment. Uh, I guess growing up on this island here sort of uh, taught me to uh, you know, self-control and everything else, which is a great part of being a submariner. Uh, a lot of times you have to do things on your own and get a thing for yourself and everything else. Uh, and uh, I've grown up with that kind of life uh, here in the island. So I really didn't have no problems adjusting to submarine life at all. A couple of years ago, Guam was a base for the nuclear Polaris submarines. It's not anymore. They pulled the last one out in 81. But now they say it is still an important place for repairing the nuclear attack submarines like this one. We'll be back right after this.
good just to uh, let you realize and let your viewers also realize uh, uh, what it's like to be an imported submarine. I think a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions, uh, which are based sometimes on fear, sometimes on on uh, just misinformation. And I think the fact that you've been able to come aboard and see for yourself, go to this and find out it's uh, it's not all spookiness out there. And in fact, it's uh, real people doing real jobs uh, with not that much danger, but a certain amount of professionalism. I think that uh, that's important that everybody understands that.